So this arrived from JLPCB, but what is it? It's a project I've been to do for a while. It's actually a distraction from another project I'm working on, which is um, building my own homebrew 8-bit CPU. But I'd bought a bunch of ICs from AliExpress and eBay, and I wasn't very sure about um, whether or not they were going to work. And um, I thought it'd be a bit fun to build a test device for them. And along the way, learn a little bit about Arduino. So in this device here, there's gonna be an Arduino sitting there, a couple of GPIO extenders, and a ZIF socket into which we can throw chips um, to test. Um, there's some resistors here, which um, either provide overcurrent protection um, or um, allow me to detect um, uh, pins on the ZIF socket that are either in a high impedance state or are unoccupied pins, which is all very exciting. This diagram here hopefully gives us a better idea of what's going on on the PCB. We've got a ZIF socket and the pins on the ZIF socket are connected back to GPIO pins on either the Arduino Nano or um, the GPIO extender chips. I've used MCP23017s, but you could use something else. Um, the, those extenders are driven using the I2 interface off the Nano, and the Nano exposes a user interface over the serial um, monitor back to a PC where you can interact with what's going on on the um, Arduino. The Arduino um, has got uh, options for you to run um, an identification test, or you can um, play with the uh, device sitting in the ZIF socket by setting things, setting pins high and low and looking at what comes out on other outputs on using an interactive mode. Let's just look at how those pins are wired up. You can see the Arduino here, but the extenders use the same pattern. What you need to look at are the GPIO, GPIO pins there on the left-hand side. Um, if we look closer, um, we can see that there's G pairs of GPIO pins attached to each test pin. So in this case here, D2 and D3 both um, attached to test pin 14. One GPIO pin has a low value resistance and the other GPIO pin has a high value resistance. Um, so I've, I'm calling those two wires GPIO L and GPIO H. Um, both those pins, those, those, both those wires connect to test pin 14 here, which runs off to pin 14 of the ZIF socket. But why are the GPIO pins organized like this? Well, it's to do with the detection of high impedance outputs of the chip under test or floating disconnected test pins. And if all we want to do was to detect one or zero outputs, then all I'd need is a single pin. Um, I'd include a low value resistance as shown here, um, again on GPIO L, um, to provide overcurrent protection. But with only one pin, we wouldn't be able to reliably detect that the test pin was connected to a high impedance output or happened to be an unoccupied pin on the ZIF. But with a second pin, we can do something else. Our second pin here is called GPIOH because it's the one with the high resistance um, in line. With GPIOH, we can apply a weak pull down or a weak pull up while GPIOL is attempting to sense the state of the output of the chip under test. And this additional trick allows us to positively distinguish between um, uh, the chip asserting a one or a zero on its output versus that pin, that wire being in a high impedance state or perhaps um, be, that pin being empty on the, on the ZIF socket. And it works like this. So we've got a few simulations here that I hope give a better idea of what's actually going on here. So the first case is where the uh, test chip's pin is a, an input or a power pin, so VCC or ground. Um, for this test, we're going to want the GPIO pin to be um, an output. Um, so we put the test chip into the socket, and then we set the GPIO out to either zero or one to drive the input of the test chip as needed. Um, we set it high if the input of the test chip is VCC or logic one, and we set it low if it's ground or logic zero. So that's pretty straightforward. The next case is pretty straightforward too. The test chip in this case, um, its pin is an output. 
and so if we want the GPIO input pin to be enabled. We put the test chip into the socket and then as the output of the test chip goes from 0 to 1, that's sensed by the GPIO input pin. Things get a little bit more complicated if the test chip's pin happens to be a tri-state pin. Of course, if that output is enabled, then the circuit is basically the circuit, the same circuit as in the previous simulation. Um, you put the chip in the socket, and as the pin changes state, that's sensed by GPIO input pin. But when the output of the test chip is in its high impedance state, there is no signal on this wire for the GPIO input pin to sense. Um, what it sees instead is um, random, random values potentially. Um, it may see values on that line which are due to capacitance on the line or um, maybe electrical noise from the environment. Or maybe it'll just see a solid one or a solid zero. But there's nothing useful there really um, for the, um, the GPIO input to detect and there's no, way, no easy way for it to determine that it's actually connected to um, uh, a high impedance or, a, 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 or a, an empty wire. So in this amendment to the previous simulation, I've added a little noise generator down here at the bottom. And what it's kind of showing is that when the um, sockets unoccupied or when the output of the test chip is in its high, high impedance state, then we see random values on that wire. And that's not useful, um, not useful for me. If you recall, I want to be able to um, distinguish uh, a, a, a definitive one or zero output value from the test chip versus um, a high impedance state on that same pin. So um, in a high impedance state, I'm going to see noise like this. Uh, it, it's, it's unreliable. I'm, I'm not going to be able to get the behavior that I want using this. So the way I solve this is by bringing another GPIO pin into the equation. And I use this GPIO pin to apply a small pull up or pull down to this wire that would um, otherwise be floating when it's disconnected. And the way it works is this. So let's say, let's go back to the situation where the test chips pin is output enabled and it's in the socket. Um, let's say that the test chips emitting um, a one. Um, we turn, while, while GPIOL is um, sensing that value, we turn on GPIOH and we apply a pull up and a pull down. And what you'll see is that GPIOL doesn't see that pull up, pull up, pull down effect. So GPIOL can conclude from that that there is a one being asserted on that wire by the test chip because the pull up and pull down is ineffective. And likewise, if the test chip is emitting um, a zero, then again, the pull up, pull down um, isn't seen by GPIOL. So GPIOL can conclude that the zero that it's seeing is a definitive zero. Now, in the high impedance state, that pull up, pull down is seen by GPIOL. So if GPIOL sees the pull up, pull down, it can conclude that either the chip is in a high impedance state or the um, pin on the ZIF socket is unoccupied. However, if whilst GPIOL is sensing a one or zero, the pull up, pull down is ineffective, then GPIOL can, can conclude that, that there's a definitive one or zero there. So that's how I tell the difference between um, a logic one, a logic zero, and some high impedance state. And that, that's worked out pretty well. So next time we'll take a look at the software. There's an interactive mode in there. There's an identify mode, um, and we'll talk about how the different um, tests, and inputs and outputs are specified. There's also a couple of miscellaneous tests. There's one that um, shows you how to identify the sockets empty, and there's another one that relates to that um, capacitance test that I talked about. There's a Hackaday I.O. site for the project as well. I keep the project logs up to date and I'd welcome any comments in there too, if you fancy it. There's also a GitHub site for the software. 
and I also keep all my documentation in here so um, you'll find my motivations summary of what I'm trying to do how the test specifications are set up um, uh, a bunch of stuff I learned along the way about the power needs of the different logic families um, stuff about easy EDA which is what I used for the um, uh, schematics and PCBs Arduino Nano um, some things that made me sad such as the problem I had with A6 and A7 um, as well as a principal operation which we've just been through well, I hope that was all interesting um, next time we'll have a look at the device itself and the software and see what it's good for Thanks a lot.